Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Wednesday. Hope you guys are all doing well. Um, I want to start with some announcements. Uh, first announcement is you guys all should have gotten an email to AP exam preparation sessions. Um, there are three different sessions you can take. You must attend one of these sessions so that you can get registered. Make sure you're registered. We already registered most of you, but not all of you are registered. Uh, we want to make sure you get registered. We want to make sure you know how to do the online test through the College Board. Um, super important. You must attend one of the three sessions this week. If you do attend the session, you will get a quiz grade of 100%. That will balance out the quiz you just took on your DBQ that a lot of you got 55s on, unfortunately, because you either didn't do it or you struggled with it. So uh, definitely worth going. It'll boost everyone's grade up. These are the three dates. You should have three different invitations. So you will choose one of these three sessions to go to. We have one today at four o'clock, another one tomorrow at 1130 or Thursday at 3 p.m. You must go to one of those three sessions. You've got an email about it. Check your email and sign up for one of those sections. Um, today we're going to uh, look at uh, the Industrial Revolution. So our content lecture is on the Industrial Revolution. I'm going to go through some slides for you. Uh, this is a long lecture, um, but I will post the lecture um, in uh, today's class. Um, and you also can watch this video as much as you want. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is one of the most significant turning points in world history. It transforms the planet in multiple ways uh, and there are very few events in history that have such an impact on world history. Um, I would say the most significant, like my top three changes in world history, number one would be uh, the Neolithic Revolution, of course, shifting from hunting and gathering to farming. That's my number one most significant change in world history. Number two, I would say, is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution transformed human society in ways greater than anything else, I would say, in the history of the world. Number three, probably Columbian Exchange. Um, those three things truly revolutionized how uh, people lived on the planet Earth. And we're going to look at the Industrial Revolution today. Um, the Industrial Revolution is not a revolution in the same sense of political revolutions that we looked at yesterday, like the American or French or Haitian Revolution, uh, but rather there, the Industrial Revolution is an extended period of technological change that transforms the economy, it transforms environments, and it transforms social structures and political structures. So the Industrial Revolution hits everything on the spice chart. So social structure, political structure, economy, environment, economics, everything, it hits it all. Um, and it begins in Europe, but as you guys know, it spreads all around the globe. Uh, and historians have put forth a lot of different conflicting reasons to explain why the Industrial Revolution got started and especially why it got started in Britain. So we're gonna look at some of the causes of Britain's Industrial Revolution first. Uh, and then kind of dive into some of the conflicting uh, explanations for industrialization as well. Um, if you remember from our lecture earlier in the year on this, Britain has geographic advantages that allow it to industrialize. Uh, the first geographic advantage it has is uh, abundant access to coal and iron and other natural resources used in factories. Um, but the access to cheap and abundant, a cheap and abundant energy source, coal, is probably the most important. England had coal deposits close to the surface. They were easy to mine. Um, 
But the other thing that England has is navigable rivers. So before they start having coal-powered factories, they actually had water-powered factories. So they, they switched to the factory system uh, using water first and you can see from this map they have rivers everywhere and these rivers are navigable so you can send a ship a raft up these rivers into these different cities you could have factories on these rivers water-powered factories um, and it would be very easy to transport the goods that were produced in these navigable rivers to other parts of great britain uh, so this helps their industrial manufacturing base get get started um, Another important precursor to any uh, society's ability to industrialize is that they have a strong agricultural foundation. Throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, England underwent something known as the agricultural revolution. Uh, this is basically a growth in food production and a growth in population. So this is happening in the 16th, the 1500s and 1600s. Uh, and one important step in this agricultural revolution was something known as enclosure. Uh, so fences went up and closed off what used to be communal land and made that land private. So landowners started becoming the Lord, started owning more land. They started devoting that land to uh, farming single crops and it forced a lot of peasants to work on these larger farms instead of producing small amounts for themselves and a little bit for the market. And they're working on these larger farms that are um, producing more goods. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the other thing that, that led to this agricultural revolution in Great Britain uh, was crop rotation. So rotating crops through the seasons uh, to take advantage of the way that crops to have them not deplete soil nutrients, to add some crops add nutrients to the soil, others deplete some nutrients. So if you rotate crops, you produce a lot more. Uh, they also used lighter plows. They developed lighter plows in the 16 and 1700s that made farming easier, um, also increased food production. And they also got new foods like the potato from the Americas, so a major explanation a major cause of the increased population uh, in Europe and in Great Britain was the arrival of American food products like potatoes, like corn. Uh, those are the big ones, squash, beans. Um, all of those helped increase food production, which leads to increased population. An increased population means you have more labor available, more people available to do the work. So this is gonna be very important once factories start getting built and people, these factory owners need laborers, the mining, the mining operations need laborers. And if you have a surplus of labor, thanks to a surplus of food, you can get that labor. Uh, historians also suggest that a politi the political environment in, in England made it easier for the industrial revolution to begin. Um, many history books, uh, including Strayer, suggests that Britain's political environment was conducive to commerce and trade and innovation uh, because there was a lot of cooperation between the merchant class, the joint stock companies, for example, and the government. Unlike other parts of Western Europe, historians uh, point out that Britain had an early political revolution in 1688, so this is 100 years before the French Revolution, uh, which limited the power of the monarch, so it gave more power to the people. Uh, and this, all the, this political re uh, revolution in 1688 also encouraged more religious tolerance. So there were people, very innovative people, who were leaving mainland Europe, like from Holland, and moving to Great Britain, and they uh, were created kind of the base of the British economy. Um, the other thing that Britain did, uh, so they had this cooperation between uh, the government and merchants and producers. Uh, the British government also outlawed unions so that business owners had more power. Uh, and they created protective tariffs and taxes on non-British goods to encourage investment in Britain uh, to protect 
British industry. Uh, and they also passed patent laws. So if you were an inventor in Britain, you could get rich off of your invent invention because your invention was protected by law. Your idea was protected by law. Uh, and this is an important incentive for people to try to tinker and try to come up with things like the steam engine or a new process to create steel. Uh, so the patent laws helped Great Britain, uh, helped, helped uh, innovators in Great Britain come up with new ideas because they knew those ideas would be protected by British law. Uh, so those are some major causes for the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain. Um, those are the ideas that you'd want to include in any, any DBQ topic about, great, about industrialization, excuse me, any DBQ topic about, about industrializa industrialization, this is your context paragraph. You would say, well, the Industrial Revolution began in Britain, it began in Europe, Britain had geographic advantages like coal. Britain had agricultural advantages. It had an increased population thanks to the agricultural revolution and new crops like potatoes from the Americas. And it had a favorable political environment in which the government and the merchants worked closely together. If you write that as your context paragraph for any, any question about industrialization, any DBQ about industrialization, you'll get the context point. So this is what you want to write for your context on any question about industrialization. Why did it start in Great Britain? Why did it start in Europe? Um, the new explanation for why Great Britain started, uh, the, why the Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain is this idea of war capitalism that we talked about. Um, and this is the idea that was kind of brought to the forefront by the Harvard historian Sven Becker in his book, Empire of Cotton. And he essentially argued that uh, Britain was able to invest in its industrial class because uh, of its success in mercantilism. But mercantilism, Becker calls war capitalism. Uh, Britain made mounds and mounds of money during the 1500s, 1600s, mostly the 1600s, early 1700s, that allowed it then to invest that money into industrial infrastructure like factories and railroads and roads and all the things that make an industrial society succeed. Um, this war capitalism is based on violent armed trade. So the joint stock companies were very violent. They took, tried to take control of the Indian Ocean. There was monopolization and manipulation of the American colonies. Uh, so Britain's making a lot of money from the American colonies. They're invested in slavery. Um, and so Beckert agrees that geography was, did play a role in the Industrial Revolution, um, but None of the technological advances or economic growth would have been possible without the foundation of war capitalism, which allowed Britain access to global markets, access to slave labor, where in African slaves worked on plantations in the Americas to grow cotton and sugar. And cotton, which was used in the British factories, was a, a key uh, resource for the Industrial Revolution. And they also acquired Asian technology. Uh, so Britain stole the idea for successful cotton production from India, uh, from China, from East Asia. Uh, so Beckert's big idea here is that Britain had an incredible advantage because of its uh, military strength and its ability to use that military strength to make money through mercantilism and to acquire resources and ideas from other parts of the world. Um, so those would all be the causes. Again, geographic advantage, coal and iron, navigable waterways, political advantages. They had a good relationship. Merchants had a good relationship with 
uh, the government in Great Britain. They had an agricultural revolution in Great Britain that led to increased population, increased food supply, leads to increased population, leads to increased labor available to work in the factories. And all of that uh, also is connected to this idea of war capitalism. That's your context paragraph for any DBQ about industrialization. You should practice writing out that DBQ context paragraph. You should practice writing it out so you have a good example that you can just kind of memorize and use if you see a DBQ on industrialization. Chances that you see a DBQ on industrialization, pretty high. So that's a good context paragraph to just memorize and write out and memorize and write out and memorize. Um, so what are the impacts of the Industrial Revolution? Impact number one is the factory system. The factory system is a transformation of labor, power, and machines inside of a factory. In a factory, the entire production process took place under one roof. It's very different from agricultural societies. Uh, in agricultural societies, families worked together around the place that they live. Industrial workers have to leave their home each day and go to the factory. So this changes how society works. In agricultural societies, uh, one person had to learn many different things, had to perform a variety of tasks all year. Uh, so, you know, if anyone has been to a farm or knows farmers, they have a thousand different jobs that they have to do every day. In factories, everyone does the same job every day. You show up and you do your thing. I'm going to hammer a nail into a shoe that's coming down this assembly line. I'm going to put on the sole of the shoe. Every day you do the same thing. So it breaks down uh, the production into parts that people can do one at a time. Um, The other thing that the factory system really changes, uh, so, may, so sorry, to just stamp that, factory labor is specialized labor. Everyone does one thing that's their specialty. Could be like putting the sole of a, of a shoe onto a shoe. Could be sewing on the button. Could be whatever. Just one thing that you do all day. Uh, the other big change with the factory system is that labor no longer revolved around the rising and setting of the sun or the seasons. Factories worked 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week through the winter and the summer. So transformed how people work, the time of day that they work, um, especially once you get uh, electricity so you can have lights or uh, to, to provide light in a factory all day, all night. Um, and days become more organized mathematically. Um, the early economic structures, this is what preceded factories. Uh, what existed before industrialization was something known as the domestic system or the cottage system uh, and farming. So in the domestic system, people would produce goods. People would make shirts and shoes and things like that. And there might be an expert who would make shoes or shirts. Um, but a lot of the work was done by individuals and it was done at a local level. It wasn't done uh, on kind of a national or regional level. Um, the textile industry is the first factory system that gets developed in Great Britain. Uh, the factory system begins in Britain's textile industry. Demand for cotton and cotton clothes is very high. Uh, and cotton is a very versatile uh, resource. It can be uh, made into a lot of different wearable materials. It's very easy to dye. And the cotton industry led to many new inventions in the 1700s. Uh, some examples are like the flying shuttle, the spinning jenny, the water frame. All of these are pictured here. Uh, and all of these inventions sped up the process by which spinners and weavers could make cotton cloth. Um, so the textile industry is the first industry that takes off in Great Britain, and it is supported by the invention of the steam engine. So the steam engine 
allows the textile industry to mechanize. It allows the textile industry to produce more cloth every minute of every hour. Um, so the invention of the steam engine really transforms industrial Great Britain because they no longer have to have factories next to rivers. Um, as a result of the steam engine, the creation of machinery, productivity goes way up. So there's much more that is produced and the prices of goods goes down. As more supply, as supply goes up, price goes down. So now you can get multiple shirts. It used to be that farmers might have one or two shirts that they just wear, wear one, have one to change into. Uh, now you could afford multiple shirts. You didn't have to just stick with one or two shirts. For, um, sorry, my phone just rang. Um, for most of your, most of your life. What are the demographic and environmental impacts of uh, the industrial revolution? Well, the first most significant impact is that uh, people leave the countryside and move to the city, rural to urban migration. Factories are built near cities where there's excess labor. Um, and people leave, especially because of there's this population growth thanks to the, the agriculture revolution, people leave the countryside and move to the city. Uh, new transportation allowed this to happen as well. Um, the, the population booms in England uh, around the time of the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Revolution also leads to an increase of population. The having more people have jobs, having more people have access to uh, an spendable income leads to more people, um, more population um, going up. Uh, the Industrial Revolution also creates more tools that can be used by farmers to increase food production. So it's kind of this self-perpetuating cycle of population going up, more people working in factories, population going up, more people working in factories. Um, transportation makes it a lot easier. Uh, this is another major impact. So first impact is of the Industrial Revolution is rural to urban migration. Second impact of the Industrial Revolution is population growth. Third major impact of the Industrial Revolution is it increases, revolutionizes transportation. The steam engine, the steamboat make it much easier to move anywhere you want. Uh, they reduce the time it takes to, for people and goods to move. So now you can have something produced in one part of the country and get that thing to another part of the country much more quickly, especially a big deal in the United States with meat. So meat used to be grown locally. You needed to get local cows and have, if you wanted to eat meat, cows or chickens or pigs, or whatever, you had to get that locally. And so there was a limit to how much you could get because the East Coast was crowded. You know, there wasn't that much land to grow uh, meat because you couldn't get meat from the middle of the country because it would spoil by the time it got to New York or to Boston. The railroad and the refrigerated car totally changed that you could get you could have meat on ranches in the midwest near chicago and iowa and all this open land huge cattle cattle ranches huge pig farms and you could get that meat to the east coast in a refrigerated uh railroad car in a matter of like a day and it would be totally fresh um, so this revolutionized access to goods it revolutionized people's ability to move. You'd say, okay, I'm gonna try to seek a better life somewhere else. I'm gonna get a train ticket, get out of town, see if I can make my fortune somewhere else. Um, the Industrial Revolution tr transformed communication to, with the creation of the telegraph. This map shows all the underwater telegraph lines that were created so you could share information uh, across continents imagine how different that would be that if you wanted to send a letter or send a message to someone it used to have to go on a boat 
all the way from Europe to the Americas. If, if you had family in the Americas, um, but now with a telegraph, you can send a message from New York to London in a matter of seconds. Totally transforms how people communicate, totally transforms how ideas are shared. It increases knowledge around the world. Um, and the last major impact of uh, the Industrial Revolution um, in terms of demographic or environmental impacts is uh, pollution. You guys read a lot of documents about how like absolutely disgusting some of the factory towns are, the slums that people live in, cholera is rampant, water pollution is terrible, uh, typhoid, there's a lot of waterborne illness, environmental illnesses. Uh, we looked at how the, the moth changed color to adapt to the coal cover, covered bark. Um, the air pollution that comes with Industrial Revolution is significant. The deforestation that comes with the Industrial Revolution is significant. Uh, so the environmental damage cannot be overlooked. Uh, and the other major demographic impact of the Industrial Revolution is global migration. Because of steamships and railroads, people start to move all over the world. There are millions and millions of people who leave, especially Europe in the 19, 1800s, to find uh, more life, better, a better life and more opportunity outside of Europe. Europe was getting very crowded. The factories were getting very crowded. People weren't able to, there was too many people, population pressure. And so global migration is the last demographic impact of the environmental, sorry, of the Industrial Revolution. Um, a couple other things that push people out of Europe, uh, if we're thinking about push-pull factors, we're gonna come back to this in, a, in another lecture, um, but the potato famine was huge. Uh, and uh, also push factors out of East Asia. Um, we'll visit all these in a lecture next week. Uh, the social impacts. Uh, we can't understate the social impacts of the Industrial Revolution. It truly transformed how people lived. Um, sorry, I have another phone call. Um, put this on silent. Um, the first major societal change is the formation of a urban working class, people moving to cities, living in small apartments, small houses and slums, going to the factory to work every day. Women joining this workforce, children joining this workforce. 70% uh, of Britain's population moved into cities, into towns and cities to work in some kind of factory or factory supporting system in the 1800s. It's a tremendous change. So people leave, they stop being farmers and peasants and they start being factory workers and working in the city. This leads to a major change in the growth of the middle class. All the people who make a little money, who become managers, who, who become line supervisors in these factories, they start to save money and they start to move into what is known as the middle class. Uh, they have new careers. There's all kinds of new careers that form because of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, bankers, insurance agents, lawyers, more schools are developed, teachers um, becomes a, a very important profession of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, park designers, clothes designers, just all kinds of jobs that we think of today as normal jobs. They didn't exist before the Industrial Revolution. And now uh, there's this huge new number of new jobs. And, and all these new jobs lead to an increase in the middle class. The middle class, we also owe for uh, coming up with um, uh, the sports that we love to watch. Basketball, American football, baseball, soccer, those are all sports that were developed during the Industrial Revolution to provide entertainment and outlet 
to people who were working in factories and they get their day off one day a week maybe and they wanted to be entertained by watching sports and playing sports themselves uh, all of those sports huge change in society um, the development of those sports um, so the growth of the middle class is huge uh, we also learned that the industrial revolution leads to public education the creation of public education schools um, for uh, excuse me schools for children um, you remember you recall that the uh, labor conditions are difficult the labor conditions are awful for women working in factories especially for women and children working in the coal mines horrible labor conditions horrible working environment you're working you know 12 to 14 hours a day six to seven days a week we talked we read about betty harris who had a friend who was pregnant went back to work the next week right after she in the coal mine right after she gave birth pulling those coal those carts out of the mine on her hands and knees children working 16 hours a day um, so the labor conditions for the lowest level workers were awful um, the abuses of children and women and workers are awful and as a result there's a political impact of the industrial revolution um, new ideas emerge that say industrialization and capitalism is completely messed up. 90% of the population is down here doing the work and it's holding up the rest of society. The industrial workers, the people who are producing the goods, the farmers, the ones who produce the stuff, don't get the benefits of all their hard work. Why is the person who is working the hardest getting paid the least? when some manager or some factory owner who doesn't do anything all day gets all the benefit. So <clears throat> this increase in the division of society led people like Karl Marx and Frederick Engels to revision how society should work. They came up with radical ideologies like communism, that all work should be equal, that all pay should be equal, that the work that a factory person does is no worse or better than what a farmer does or what a lawyer does or what what a dentist does in fact the workers who produce food are probably more important than lawyers who just work in offices uh, or bankers who just move money around because they're actually producing something so they should be treated as the most important workers in society not a banker or a lawyer um, and this idea of communism really starts to take hold unions start to take hold so these uh, workers start to, they spend all day in a factory together, they start to talk to each other and they start to say, hey, hey, why should we be working 120 hours a week when we can say, let's take some time off, let's work in shifts so that we get some turn, some downtime. And so they start to unionize and advocate for, for their rights. <coughs> um, and in response to some of these radical ideologies, and this political environment, the government does respond. The government starts to uh, uh, pass laws to protect children, to keep children out of factories and out of mines, to send them to school. Governments start to recognize unions and say, okay, it's okay for you to unionize and we'll negotiate with your union. Um, so the abolition of child labor, legalized unions, the creation of state pensions and retirement, uh, for workers who are working their whole life in a factory. All these things are important political reforms for the Industrial Revolution. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about today is the spread of industrial, of the Industrial Revolution from um, Europe to the United States, to Russia, and to Japan. Uh, the DBQ you guys are going to work on is going to be tomorrow is going to be about industrial the industrial revolution um if you stayed with me in this lecture i just gave you a huge hint uh and industrialization spreads very differently to different parts
parts of the world. It kind of happens naturally in Europe. It spreads from business to biz business through private enterprise and the government side kind of sees what's happening and says, oh, we better get on board with this. That also is what happens in the United States. The government doesn't enforce industrialization on anyone. The US government doesn't decide now is time to industrialize and therefore, you know, make people build factories and create factories using government resources. It's all individuals. It's all private kind of uh, natural growth process. The same is not true in Russia. Russia realized that they were behind, that they were falling way behind their European friends in Germany, France, Belgium, Britain. And they realized that if they didn't industrialize like their neighbors, they were going to get left out and be very far behind. So they start industrializing through a forced industrialization process. This is sometimes referred to as the WIT system, named after Sergei Witt, who said, we need to build railroads and we need to build factories and the government needs to do it and we need to catch up with the rest of Europe. So Russia kind of <coughs> forces the country to start industrializing. Uh, similarly, Japan is forced to industrialize because uh, Americans and Europeans show up and they say, hey, uh, we're going to conquer you unless you start trading with us and opening up your ports. And uh, we've industrialized already. We have steam powered gunboats. You don't have anything like that. And Japan realized that they also needed to uh, get on top of it very quickly. They needed to industrialize. This is known as the Meiji Restoration, where Japan realizes that instead of being conquered like China in the Opium Wars, we're going to industrialize. We're going to end our period of isolation. We're going to send people out to learn all the best practices from Europe and the United States. We're going to send our Japanese uh, engineers and, and young scholars out to learn about how to do industrialization. We're going to bring them back and we're going to industrialize. We're going to do something known as selective westernization. We're going to keep some very strong, important parts of our culture and society, Japanese, but we're also going to embrace some things from Europe and the United States. We're going to embrace industrial techniques. We're going to embrace some government reforms. And we're going to modernize our society. And so Japan and Russia are two good uh, examples, two good case studies of countries that did not industrialize kind of naturally and piecemeal like <clears throat> Great Britain, Europe, and the United States, but that use some kind of government incentive and government sponsorship. Government pushed people in, to industrialize in Japan and Russia. Um, that, again, WIT system in Russia, build railroads, build factories, catch up with Europe, in Japan, it's the Meiji Restoration, Selective Westernization. We need to industrialize. We need factories. We need steamships. We need railroads. And we need some government reforms that keep our country, that will help our country catch up. And Japan does an amazing job of it, as you guys know. Eventually, it becomes uh, an imperial superpower uh, leading to World War II. Um, so, that's what we got today. Uh, that was a long lecture, I know. I'll post the notes and the slides. Um, good luck on your DBQ practice tomorrow. <laughs>